This is going to be part one of chapter two of Liev Gumilyov's Ethnogenesis in the Biosphere. Chapter two is titled The Properties of an Ethnos, and this section will run from the beginning up until just after footnote eight. We will stop when we reach the title of the paragraph that's called Ethnos and the Four Separations of Time. This is chapter two of Liev Gumilyov's Ethnogenesis and the Biosphere, the Properties of an Ethnos, containing a list of the features of an ethnic phenomenon as such, compiled so as to make it possible to give a general explanation of ethnogenesis, the process in which ethnoi arise and disappear. Ethnos and Ethnonym Names Deceive when one is studying the general patterns of ethnology, one must remember above all that a real ethnos and an ethnonym, i.e. an ethnic name, are not the same thing. We often encounter several different ethnoi bearing one and the same name. Conversely, one ethnos may be called differently. The word Romans, Romani, for instance, originally meant a citizen of the polis, Rome, but not at all the Italics, and not even the Latins, who inhabited other towns of Latium. In the epoch of the Roman Empire in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, the number of Romans increased through the inclusion among them of all Italians. Etruscans, Samnites, Ligurians, Gauls, and many inhabitants of the provinces, by no means of Latin origin. After the Edict of Caracalla in A.D. 212, all free inhabitants of the municipalities on the territory of the Roman Empire were called Romans, i.e. Greeks, Cappadocians, Jews, Berbers, Gauls, Illyrians, Germans, etc. The concept Roman lost its ethnic meaning, as it were, but that was not so. It simply changed it. The general element became unity not even of culture, but of historical fate, instead of unity of the origin and language. The ethnos existed in that form for three centuries, a considerable period, and it did not break up. On the contrary, it was transformed in the 4th and 5th centuries AD through the adoption of Christianity as the state religion, which began to be the determinate principle after the Fourth Ecumenical Council. Those who recognized these councils sanctioned by the state authority were Romans, and those who did not became enemies. A new ethnos was formed on that basis that I conventionally call Byzantine, but they themselves but they called but they themselves called themselves Romaic, i.e. Romans, though they spoke Greek. A large number of Slavs, Armenians, and Syrians were gradually merged into the Romaic but they retained the name Romans until 1453, until the fall of Constantinople. The Romaic considered precisely themselves Romans, but not the population of Italy, where Langobards had become feudal lords, Syrian Semites, who had settled in Italy, then becoming deserted in the 1st to 3rd centuries AD, the townsmen, and the former colons from prisoners of war of all peoples at any time conquered by the Roman Empire became peasants. Florentines, Genoese, Venetians, and other inhabitants of Italy considered themselves Romans and not the Greeks, and on those grounds claimed the priority of Rome where only ruins remained of the antique city. A third branch of the ethnonym Romans arose on the Danube, which had been a place of exile after the Roman conquest of Dacia. There, Phrygians, Cappadocians, Thracians, Galatians, Syrians, Greeks, Illyrians, in short, all the eastern subjects of the Roman Empire, served sentences for rebellion against Roman rule. To understand one another, they conversed in the generally known Latin tongue. When the Roman legions left Dacia, the descendants of the exiled settlers remained and formed an ethnos that took the name Romanian, i.e. Roman, in the 19th century. If one can treat the continuity between Romans of the age of the Republic 
and the Roman citizens of the late empire, even as a gradual extension of the concept functionally associated with the spread of culture, there is no such link even between the Byzantines and the Romans, from which it follows that the word changed meaning and content and cannot serve as an identifying attribute of the ethnos. It is obviously also necessary to take into consideration the context in which the word and so the epoch has a semantic content because the meaning of words changes in the course of time. That is even more indicative when we analyze the ethnonyms Turk, Tatar, and Mongol as an example that cannot be left aside. Examples of Camouflage In the 6th century AD, a small people living on the eastern steppes of the Altai and Kongai Mountains were called Turks. Through several successful wars, they managed to subordinate the whole steppe from Hingan to the Sea of Azov. The subject of the great Khaganate, who preserved their own ethnonyms for internal use, also began to be called Turks, since they were subject to the Turkish Han. When the Arabs conquered Sogdiana and clashed with the nomads, they began to call all of them Turks, including the Ugro Magyars. In the 18th century, European scholars called all nomads Le Tartar, and in the 19th century, when linguistic classification became fashionable, the name Turk was arrogated to a definite group of languages. Many peoples thus fell into the category Turk, who had not formed part of it in antiquity. For example, the Yakuts, Chuvash, and the hybrid people, the Ottoman Turks, about whose origins I have spoken above. The modification of the ethnonym Tatar is an example of direct camouflage. Up to the 12th century, this was the ethnic name of a group of 30 big clans inhabiting the banks of the Korulen. In the 12th century, this nationality increased in numbers, and Chinese geographers began to call all the Central Asian nomads Turkish. Turkish-speaking, Tungus-speaking, and Mongol-speaking, including the Mongols, Tatars. That sentence is confusing. What he's saying is that the Chinese began to call all Central Asian nomads, whether they were Turkish-speaking, Tungusic-speaking, or Mongolian-speaking. They called everyone a Tatar. And even when, in 1206, Genghis Khan officially called all his subjects Mongols, neighbors continued for some time, from some time out of habit to call them Tatars. In this form, the word Tatar reached Eastern Europe as a synonym of the word Mongol and became acclimatized in the Volga Valley where the local population began, as a mark of loyalty to the Han of the Golden Horde, to call themselves Tatars. But the original bearers of this name, the Karaites, Naimans, Oirats, and Tatars, began to call themselves Mongols. Footnote 1. The names thus changed places. Since that time, a scientific terminology arose in which the Tatar anthropological type began to be called Mongoloid, in the language of the Volga Kipchak Turks, Tatar. In other words, we may even employ an obviously camouflaged terminology in science. But then it is not simply a matter of confusion, but of an ethnonymic phantasmagoria. Not all the nomad subjects of the Golden Horde were loyal to its government. The rebels who lived in the steppes west of the Urals began to call themselves Nogai, and those who lived on the eastern borders of the Jochi Ulus in Tabargatai on the banks of the Irtush, who were practically independent because of their remoteness from the capital, became the ancestors of the Kazakhs. These ethnoi arose in the 14th and 15th centuries as a consequence of rapid mixing of various ethnic components. The ancestors of the Nogai were the Palavtsi, Stepalans, Central Asian Turks, who survived a defeat by Batu and were taken into the Mongol army, and inhabitants of the southern frontier of Rus, who adopted Islam, which became a symbol at that time of ethnic consolidation. The Tatars included Kama Bulgars, Khazars, and Bertasi, and also some of the Palavtsi and the Ugric Mashari. The population of the White Horde was the mixture. Three Kazakh Yus were formed from it in the 15th century, but that is not yet all. 
At the end of the 15th century, Russian bands from the upper Volga began to attack the middle Volga Tatar towns, forced some of the population to quit their homeland and go off into Central Asia under the chieftainship of Shaibani Khan. 1500 to 1510. There they were met as fierce enemies because the local Turks, who at that time bore the name of Chagatai, after Genghis Khan's second son, Chagatay, the chief of the Central Asian Ulus, were ruled by descendants of Timur, the enemy of the steppe and Volga Tatars, who ravaged the Volga Valley in 1398 to 1399. The members of the horde who quit their homeland and took on a new name, Uzbeks, to honor the Khan, Uzbeg, 1312 to 1341, who had established Islam and the Golden Horde as the state religion. In the 16th century, the Uzbeks defeated Babur, the last of the Timurites, Timurides, who led the remnants of his supporters into India and conquered a new kingdom for himself there. So the Turks who remained in Samarkand and Fergana bear the name of their conquerors, the Uzbeks. The same Turks who went to India began to be called Mughals in memory of their having been, 300 years earlier, subject to the Mongol Empire. But the genuine Mongols who settled in eastern Iran in the 13th century, and even retained their language, are called Khazaritsi from the Persian word Khazar, a thousand, meaning a military unit or division. But where are the Mongols, by whose name the yoke that lay on Rus for 240 years is known? They were not an ethnos, because by Genghis Khan's will, Jochi, Batu, Orda, and Shebani each received 4,000 warriors, of whom only part came from the Far East. The latter were called Kins and not Tatars, from the Chinese name of the Jurchen. This rare name occurred for the last time in the Zedon Shina, in which Mamai was called Kinish. Consequently, the yoke was not Mongol at all, but was enforced by the ancestors of the nomad Uzbeks, who should not be confused with the settled Uzbeks, although they merged in the 19th century and now constitute a single ethnos, who equally revere the Timurides and the Shabanides, who were deadly enemies in the 16th century, because that enmity had already lost sense and meaning in the 17th century. The Helplessness of Philology and History The examples cited are sufficient to establish that the ethnic name, or even the own name and the phenomenon of an ethnos as a stable collective of the species Homo sapiens, by no means cover each other. Therefore, the philological method, which investigates words, is inapplicable in ethnology and we have to turn to history in order to check how far this discipline can help with the posing of my problem. But here too we come up against unexpected difficulties. The unit of investigation employed by historical science is the social institution which may be a state, a tribal union, a religious sect, a trading company, a political party, etc. In short, any institution in any age and among any peoples. The institution of the state and the ethnos sometimes coincide, and then in some cases we observe nations of a modern type. But that is a case characteristic of the 19th and 20th centuries. In antiquity, such coincidences were rare. It happens that a religious sect unites like-minded persons who, like the Sikhs, for example, in India, merge into an ethnos. Then the origin of people incorporated by the community is not taken into account. But such communities are often unstable and break up into ethnoi as happened to the Muslim communities founded by Muhammad in the 7th century AD. While a process of the merging of Arab tribes, Syrians, and in part Persians, into a single ethnos took part under the first four caliphs in the countries of Islam. That process had already ceased under the Umayyads, A.D. 651 to 750, that would be Umayyads, I think, more commonly, and under the Abbasids, the descendants of the conquerors and the conquered merged into a new ethnoi with a single interethnic culture conventionally called Mohammedan, with Arabic, an awareness of its unity by comparison with Christians and pagans, but with different historical fates 
and different stereotypes of behavior, which were expressed in the creation of diverse sects and ideological conceptions. The emirates and sultanates that arose throughout the isolation of Ethnoi would seem to have corresponded to the ethnic boundaries, but that was not so. Successful commanders subordinated territories to themselves for a short time with a population speaking different languages, but later, but these later became the victims of neighbors, i.e. of political formations that had a different faith than the ethnic entity. Community of historical fate, of course, encouraged the formation and maintenance of an ethnos, but historical fate, footnote 2, can also be the same for two or three nationalities and for two parts of a single and different for two parts of a single one. The Anglo-Saxons and Celtic Welsh, for example, have been united state-wise since the 13th century, but they have not merged into one ethnos, which incidentally does not prevent them from living in peace. The Eastern Armenians, already subject to Iran in the 3rd century AD, and the Western, connected from that time with Byzantium, had different fates, but their ethnic unity was not disrupted. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the French Huguenots and Catholics were very different in their historical fates and even in the character of their culture, both before the Edict of Nantes and after its repeal. But the ethnic integrity of France remained unaltered in spite of bloody wars and dragonades. The forming of an ethnos, i.e. ethnogenesis, consequently lies deeper than the apparent historical processes recorded by the sources. History can help ethnology, but not replace it. Mosaic structure as a property of an ethnos. It is possible to manage without a genteel system. Many ethnoi are divided into tribes and clans. Can this division be considered an obligatory, essential quality of an ethnos, or even the first stage in its formation? Or finally, the form of a collective preceding the development of the ethnos itself. The reliable material at our disposal makes it possible to answer no. First of all, far from all contemporary peoples have or had any kind of genteel or tribal division. There were not and are not such among the Spaniards, French, Italians, Romanians, English, Ottoman Turks, Great Russians, Ukrainians, Sikhs, Greeks, but not Hellenes, and many other nations. But a clan or genteel system exists among Celts, Kazakhs, Mongols, Tungus, Arabs, Kurds, and a number of other peoples. It is difficult to consider a genteel system an earlier stage, because the Byzantines or the Sassanid Persians were people formed a thousand years earlier than the Mongols and twelve hundred years earlier than the Kazakhs, and they got along magnificently without clans and phratries. One can, of course, suppose that a system of clans was general in antiquity, but if so, such an assumption has no relation to the historical period when peoples, or ethnoi, arose before the historian's eyes. It is more correct to recognize that the schema, clan, tribe, people, nation, applies to social development, i.e., lies on a different plane. That the predominant forms of community life were different forms of family over the time of the existence of Homo sapiens, viz. group marriage, the Punaluan family, pairing marriage, the monogamous family, footnote 3, is quite well substantiated and demonstrated, but it has no direct relation to my problem, since an ethnic entity does not coincide either with the family cell or with the level of production and culture. I must therefore look for other criteria and other identification signs in my study. At the same time, one must note that among peoples with a genteel tribal system, the division into clans among Celts, Fratries, Siak among the Altaitsi, and tribal associations, Jews among Kazakhs, etc., is constructive. These intra-ethnic units are needed in order to maintain the ethnic entity itself. The relations both of the separate individuals to the ethnos as a whole and of the genteel or family collectives among themselves 
are regulated through the division into groups. Exogamy, preventing blood-related marriages, is only maintained by this means. The members of a clan or family express the will of their fellow tribesmen at folk gatherings and create stable alliances so as to wage external wars, both defensive and offensive. In Scotland, for example, the clan system withstood the raids of Vikings in the 10th century, the attacks of feudal lords in the 12th to 15th centuries, and war with the English bourgeoisie in the 17th and 18th centuries, and only capitalist relations were able to disrupt it. Where the clan system was less expressed, among the Elba Slavs, for example, German and Danish knights made short work of it in two centuries, the 11th and 12th, in spite of the undisputed bellicosity and enviable courage of the Bodrici, Lutici, the Validi, and the inhabitants of the Isle of Ringan. The division of an ethnos into tribes had the function of a skeleton on which muscles could grow, and so gather strength for struggle against the environment. Let me try to propose another system of reference suitable not for not for some, but for the whole aggregate of observed collisions. What the genteel system was replaced by. How is the absence of genteel tribal groups made good among quite developed peoples who were at the stage of class society? The class stricture and class struggle in slave owning, feudal, and capitalist formations are also an established fact and do not need examinations. The division into classes cannot, consequently, be functionally analogous to division into tribes. And as we observe, parallel to the division of society into classes, a division of ethnoi into groups that by no means coincide with classes. They can be conventionally called corporations, but that word corresponds to the concept only as a first approximation and will subsequently be replaced. In feudal, Euro in feudal Europe, for example, the dominant class within an ethnos, the French will say, consisted of various corporations. One, the barons or feudal lords in the direct sense, i.e. the holders of fiefs linked with crown by a vassal oath. Two, knights, united in orders. Three, notables, who constituted the apparatus of royal power, noblesse de robe. 4. The higher clergy. 5. Scholars, for example, the professors of the Sorbonne. 6. The urban patriciate, which was itself divided territorially, and so on. According to the accepted degree of approximation, one can distinguish a greater or less number of groups, but one must necessarily, in that connection, still allow for membership of parties. For example, the Armagnac and Burgundian at the beginning of the 15th century. As for the popular masses, such a division is applicable to an even greater degree, since each feudal province then had a clearly expressed individual character. In the 12th century, for example, the people of Rouen displayed hostilities to Philippe II and Auguste, who had liberated them from the English and the Provençal, learning of Louis IX's plan in Egypt, sang a Te Deum, hoping to be delivered from the sire. Footnote 4. We no longer see such corporations in bourgeois society, but the principle remains unchanged. For each individual within ethnoi, there are, besides classes, people of this circle and others. But as regards foreign expansion, all these groups acted as a single whole, as Frenchmen. It is indisputable that corporations, as I have conditionally called them, are much less stable and viable than genteel tribal groupings, but the latter, too, are not eternal. The difference between them and other groups is not, of course, one of principle. The similarity is that they have an identical functional purpose, maintaining unity of the ethnos through internal division. The most important and curious point is that corporations differ from one another in their origin, only by nuances of psychology. But the differences deepen and crystallize with time, passing into customs and rituals, i.e., into phenomena studied by ethnographers. The old Slavonic kissing custom, for example, 
was transformed in Russia and Poland into kissing of the hands of married ladies and was retained among the landed nobility, but disappeared from the life of other strata of the population. Maxim Gorky, who observed the life of the lower middle class and middle class intellectuals in the Volga towns, noted such deep differences that he suggested treating these recently formed groups of the population as different tribes. To some extent that was true, and Gorky was right in recording the differences in everyday life, morals, and notions, and his obser observances were fruitful. In our day, these differences have been nearly wiped out. They were characteristic of a short period of about 80 years, but I've already said that the duration of a, of a phenomenon does not affect the fundamental aspect of the matter. The Formation of Ethnic Subgroups The concept of corporation in the sense proposed is clear, but it is not sufficient for my analysis since it suggests that a given unit is not only formed from ethnographic features, but is also demarcated from other corporations by social barriers. Subethnic subdivisions often do not coincide with social ones, which indicates that the example adduced is a partial case of the general rule I am seeking. Let us turn to the ethnogenesis of the French. In the 16th century, the Reformation affected this people and reshuffled all the former corporations among them until they were unrecognizable. The feudal aristocracy, the petty nobility, the bourgeoisie, and the peasantry proved to be split into papists and Huguenots. The social bases of both groups did not differ, but ethno-territorial subdivisions were distinctly visible. Calvinism was successful among the Celts of the Lower Loire, while the merchant La Rochelle, well, where merchant La Rochelle became a stronghold of the reformers. The Gascon seigneurs and kings of Navarre adopted Calvinism. The descendants of the Burgundians, the peasants of the Cévennes, and the heirs of the Albigenses, the bourgeoisie of the Languedoc, joined the movement. But Paris, Lorraine, and central France remained faithful to the Roman Church. All the former corporations disappeared since belonging to a community or church became an indicator, for two centuries, of membership of one ethnic subunit or another. One cannot say that theology played a decisive role. Most Frenchmen were politicians, i.e., refused to be interested in the disputes of the Sorbonne and Geneva. The illiterate Gascon barons, the semi-savage Sevan Highlanders, the bold corsairs of La Rochelle, or the artisans of the suburbs of Paris and Angers, were by no means understood of the fine points of the interpretation of predestination or preexistence. If some gave their lives for the Mass or for the Bible, that meant that one or the other was a symbol of their self-assertion and opposition to one another, and so an indicator of deep contradictions. These were not class contradictions since nobles, peasants, and bourgeois fought on both sides. But Catholics and Huguenots really were divided by stereotypes of behavior. And that, as we agreed at the beginning, is the main principle of ethnic peculiarity, for which there are adequate grounds. Adequate grounds. But what if the Huguenots had kept a patch of land for themselves and created an independent state like, say, the Swiss or the North Americans? they would probably have been regarded as a special ethnos, arising through the zigzags of historical fate, because they would have had a special way of life, culture, mentality, and perhaps language, since they would hardly have conversed in Parisian, but would rather have chosen one of their local dialects. It would have been a similar process to the separation of the Americans from the English, the Scots are undoubtedly an ethnos, but they are composed of highlanders, Celts, and lowlanders, inhabitants of the Valley of the Tweed. Their origin is different. The old population, the Caledonians or Picts, who painted themselves, repulsed the onslaught of the Romans in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. In the 3rd century, Scots migrating from Ireland were added to them. Both tribes made destructive raids on Romanized Britannia, and then on the northern fringes of England, fought against the Norwegian Vikings who had established themselves in the east of the island. In AD 954, the Scots were fortunate. They conquered Lothian, and on the plain of the banks of the Tweed settled by descendants of Saxons and North Vikings. 
The Scottish kings acquired many rich subjects, and enjoying their aid and support, limited the independence of the chiefs of the Celtic clans. But they had to adopt many of the customs of their subjects, in, in particular feudal institutions and manners and customs. The rich, energetic inhabitants of Lothian compelled their Celtic sovereigns to turn Scotland into a small kingdom, because they had taken on defense of the borders with England. In the 14th century, French adventurers, comrades in arms of John Balliol and Robert Bruce, poured into Scotland for the war with England. The French increased the number of border barons. The Reformation mainly embraced the Celts, but in the valleys, Catholics held their ground with the Calvinists. In short, races and cultures, a clan system, and feudalism were merged during the genesis of this people but the complexity of its composition did not disrupt its monolithic ethnic character, which was manifested in clashes with the English and later with the Irish. Russian old believers are another characteristic example of a different order. They were a small section of the great Russians who did not adopt certain reforms of church ritual proclaimed by the patriarch Nikon in the 17th century. At that time, the church service had the function not only of religion, but also of a synthetic art, i.e. filled an aesthetic vacuum. Therefore, the requirements and performance of the rites and rituals were very high. But as in our day, far from all immediately recognized and adopted the new style and trend in music, or for example in painting, and so the replacement of dark images in the 17th century by new rose and blue icons shocked a certain part of the worshippers. They simply could not concentrate in a situation that irritated them. In reality, there was almost the same split of the ethnos as happened in Western Europe during the Reformation. Not all the Orthodox Christians plumped for the old ritual, but those who did clung firmly to it, fearing neither execution nor torture. When there was a chance, they passed to the counterattack, and dealt with the iconolaters as sharply as they with them. This happened during the Streltsy uprising at the time of the regency of Tsarevna Sophia. The heat of passions was identical on both sides. In the 17th century, the dispute was only about church ritual, but other respects in everyday life, the system of education, habits and customs, the old believers were indistinguishable from the general mass of Russians. In the second generation, under Peter the Great, they constituted a definite, isolated group of the population. At the end of the 18th century, customs, ritual, and dress developed, and partly were retained among them, that differed markedly from those generally accepted. Catherine II banned persecution of the old believers, but that did not lead to their merging back into the main mass of the ethnos. Millionaire merchants, Cossacks and the semi-destitute Transvolgan peasants formed part of the newly formed intra-ethnic identity, intra-ethnic entity. This entity, initially united by a community of fate, i.e. by attachment to principles so dear that they went to their death for them, became a group united by a community way of life, headed by spiritual leaders or teachers of various branches and trends. In the 20th century, it gradually began to break up since the reason for its origin had long ceased to exist and only remained through inertia. These examples I have cited are clear but rare. The function of intra-ethnic groups were more often assumed by naturally formed territorial associations of fellow countrymen. The existence of such divisions, like the existence of fratries in the genteel system, does not undermine ethnic unity. We can now draw some conclusions. The social, forms in which ethno, intra, the social forms in which intra-ethnic entities are embodied are vague and do not always coincide with the subdivisions of an ethnos. Intra-ethnic splintering is a condition that maintains the unity of the ethnos and gives it stability. It is characteristic of any time and stage of development. Variation of ethnic contacts. So far, I have examined separate groups within big ethnoi, but the problem is by no means exhausted by that. Pure forms of ethnoi are not observed in the real historical process, 
but rather various variants of ethnic contacts arising in territories inhabited by different ethnoi, united politically in a polyethnic state. Four variants can be when we study their relations. A. Coexistence, in which the ethnoi do not merge and do not imitate each other, borrowing only technical innovations. B. Assimilation, i.e. the swallowing up of one ethnos by another and with complete forgetting of origin and old traditions. C. Crossbreeding, in which traditions of the preceding ethnoi and a memory of the ancestors are retained and combined. These variants are usually unstable and exist through replenishment by new matices. D. Merging, in which the traditions of the original components are forgotten and a third new ethnos arises alongside the two precursors or in place of them. That is essentially the main variant of ethnogenesis. For some reason, it is observed less frequently than all the others. Let me illustrate this four-part schema by clear examples. Variant A is the most common. All things and phenomena are recognized by their interactions. Soda and citric acid poured together give a reaction of neutralization with a vigorous fizzing only when water is poured on them. In history, reactions go on all the time, as in an aqueous solution, and there is no hope of that being finished. Even the simple coexistence of different ethnoi with rapprochement and growing intimacy is not neutral. Sometimes it is simply necessary. In the upper reaches of the Congo, for instance, Bantu and Pygmies live in a symbiosis. The Negroes cannot move in the forest except by paths without the help of the Pygmies, while the paths are rapidly overgrown and less cleared. The Bantu can get lost in the forest like a European and die within 20 meters of his own home. But the Pygmies need knives, vessels, and other articles of daily use. For these two ethnoi, dissimilarity is the guarantee of well-being, and their friendship is founded on that. A variant of lengthy coexistence with constant enmity was well described by Leo Tolstoy, who observed the skirmishes of Graben Cossacks and Chechens. But he faithfully noted the mutual respect of the two neighboring ethnoi and the wariness of the Cossacks towards the soldiers who were the pioneers on the Terek assimilation of the Cossacks by the Great Russians, which was completed by the beginning of the 20th century. Variant B, assimilation, usually occurs through the methods not so much bloody as shameful. The object of assimilation is presented with an alternative, abandon either conscience or life. It can avoid death by repudiating everything dear and accustomed for the sake of being converted into a second-class person among the victors. The latter also gain little since they acquire hypocritical, and as a rule, inferior fellow countrymen, because only the outward manifestation of the behavior of the conquered ethnos can be controlled, and not its mood. The Irish persuaded the English of that in the 19th century. Simon Bolivar's partisans the Spaniards, and the Dungans the Chinese. There are too many examples, but the matter is clear. Variant C, crossbreeding, is observed very often, but the progeny of exogamous marriages either die out in the third or fourth generation or break up into paternal and maternal lines. For example, in the 16th century, the Turks considered it sufficient to pronounce the formula of professing Islam and submitting to the Sultan in order to become a true Turk. In other words, they regarded ethnic affiliation a state that could be changed at will. Turks, therefore, willingly took any adventurers into service if they were specialists in some craft or in the art of war. The consequences of that made themselves felt within a hundred years. The decline of the sublime port in the 17th century attracted the attention in its time of contemporaneous Turkish writers. In their view, Ajan Oglani, i.e. the children of renegades, were the reason for the decline. The influx of the foreign-born spoiled the stereotype of behavior, which told in the venality of the viziers, 
the purchaseability of judges, the fall in the fighting capacity of troops, and the collapse of the economy. By the beginning of the 19th century, Turkey had become the sick man. The role of exogamy. The introduction of foreigners into Turkey sharpened the crisis of class contradictions already growing. Without that, without that, for which the conversion of ethnic unity into a chimera played the role of catalyst. Because everyone understood that sincere, loyal officials were more valuable than hypocritical, unprincipled ones. Conversely, the development of class contradictions played the role of a vector for the ethnogenesis of the Ottoman ethnos. The combination of ethnic and social processes in one region was a factor of the anthropogenic destruction of the terrain of what had been one of the richest countries in the world, called in antiquity the Fertile Crescent. Salim I's conquest in the 16th century put Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and Mesopotamia where intensive agriculture had already transformed the original landscape in the 3rd millennium BC into the hands of the Ottoman sultans. The Sumerians had divided the water from the land in the lower reaches of the Tigris and the Euphrates, and contemporaries called the land they created Eden. The Akkadians built Babylon, the Gate of God, the first city in the world with a million inhabitants, for which there was food, with enough food without imports from farther countries. Antioch and later Damascus were large, gay, cultured cities flourishing at the expense of local resources. Asia Minor fed huge Constantinople. But the cultivated landscape had to be constantly maintained. The Arab caliphs had understood that buying slaves in Zanzibar to keep up irrigation in Mesopotamia and also the Byzantine autocrats who had reinforced the small peasant farms by special edicts as the most intensive in those natural conditions, and even the Mongol Ilkhan Ghazan, Ilkhan, Ilkhan Ghazan, who organized the building of a canal in the waterless part of northern Mesopotamia. The disintegration of the cultivated terrain of Western Asia set in later, in the 17th to 19th centuries, during the profound peace and decline of the Ottoman Empire, because the Syrian, Iranian, Cilician peasants, worn out by exactions, abandoned their plots and sought a better lot in the pirate coastal cities, where one could either get rich easily or lay down one's life. And those who stayed at home through laziness or cowardice neglected the irrigation and turned the country, once rich and abundant, into a wasteland. The beginning of that terrible, disastrous process was already visible to contemporaries. The French adventurer and doctor in Aurangzebe's guard, Francois Bernier, who had observed similar things in India under the rule of the Great Mogul, predicted, in a letter to Colbert, the inevitable weakening of the three great Muslim empires, India, Turkey, and Persia, considering, as regards the last named, that the decline would be slow since the Persian aristocracy was of local origin. Footnote 5. And I must agree with him that, with a stable social system and one in the same formation, but with the changing ratio of the ethic, ethnic components in the political system or state, the state of the countryside, like a sensitive barometer, indicates that the beginning or the existence of rises and falls and of periods of stabilization. That being so, we have no grounds for denying the cause of the decline mentioned above, namely the appearance in the system of new ethnic groups not linked with the terrain of the region and limitations on exogamous marriages because these bands, by maintaining the mixed ethnic nature of the region, led to the preservation of terrains containing small ethnic groups. But since that is so, then free intercourse and free love ruin, nature, and culture. That is an unexpected and alarming conclusion, but it is a paraphrase of Newton's second law, that what is gained in social freedom is lost through contact with nature, or rather with the geographical environment and one's own physiology, because nature also lies within our bodies. Since similar phenomena occurred in both Rome and ancient Iran, and in many other countries, one can easily note a general pattern. 
Where there is endogamy as an ethnic barrier, things proceed more slowly and less painfully. But it is not at all the same for an ethnos, whether it takes 300 or 1,000 years. Bromley's observation about the stabilizing role of endogamy as a barrier against incorporation is therefore indisputable. Footnote 6. An Experiment in Interpretation Let us try to interpret the phenomenon described. If ethnoi are processes, then when two dissimilar processes clash, interference will arise disturbing the rhythm of both components. The resulting association will be chimeric, which means unstable to outside effects and short-lived. Death of the chimeric system will entail annihilation of its components and ex extinction of the people involved in the system. Such is the general mechanism of the disruption of the pattern, but it has its exceptions, namely that with slackening of the original rhythms, a new one sometimes arises, i.e. a new ethnogenetic inertial process. I shall not say what this is associated with, because that this is too serious a matter to resolve as a side issue. But endogamy is clearly necessary in order to maintain ethnic traditions, because the endogamous family passes on a developed stereotype of behavior to a child, while an exogamous one passes on two stereotypes that mutually cancel each other out. Exogamy, which is not related at all to social states and lies on a different plane, thus proves to be a factor of ethnogenesis, i.e. a real destructive factor during contact on a super-ethnic level. And even in rare cases when a new ethnos develops in a zone of contact, it absorbs, i.e. annihilates, both of the former ones. In conclusion, let me point out that in the example cited and also in the overwhelming majority of cases, the racial principle plays no role. It is not a matter of somatic differences, but rather behavioral, or behavioral ones, because the steppe dwellers, Tibetan hillmen and Chinese, belong to a single first-order mongoloid race. And it is obvious that, with closer approximation to second-order race, North Chinese are racially closer to Zhangbi and Tibetans than to Southern Chinese. But the outward similarity of cranial indices, eye color, hair color, epicanthus, etc., has no significance for ethnogenetic processes. It is also obvious from the example adduced that the link between ethnos and topography, sometimes doubted, really exists. The Hani, having seized the valley of the Huang Ho, pastured their cattle there. The Chinese acquired the arable land and built canals, but their hybrids, not having the skills of either cattle herding or cultivation, predatorily fleeced neighbors and subjects, which led to the formation of long fallow lands and restoration of the natural biokinosis, although impoverished by the cutting down of forests and the killing of ungulates during the emperor's hunts. Everything tallies. So not only do theoretical considerations, but also the necessity of interpreting the factual data force us to reject the conception of an ethnos as a state. But if an ethnos is the result of a long-lasting process of ethnogenesis, it is part of the biosphere of Earth. And since changes of terrain through the use of technique are linked with an ethnos, ethnology should be ranked among the geographical sciences although it draws its initial material from history in the narrow sense of the term, i.e., study of events and their connection and sequence. The ethnic stereotype of behavior. Dissimilarity is a principle. Every ethnos has its own inner structure and its unique stereotype of behavior. Sometimes the structure and stereotype change from generation to generation. That indicates that the ethnos is developing and that ethnogenesis is not, as a rule, dying away. The structure is sometimes stable because each new generation reproduces the life cycle of the preceding one. Such ethnoi can be called persistent, i.e. enduring, but I shall be going into that aspect of the matter below, and for the present will make the concept structure more precise, irrespective of its degree of stability and the character of its variability. The structure of an ethnos is a strictly defined standard of relations, a, between the collective and individual, 
B, between individuals, C, between intra-ethnic groups, and D, between the ethnos and its intra-ethnic groups. These norms are unique in each case, do not exist visibly, change now rapidly and now slowly in all fields of living and everyday life being perceived in a given ethnos and in each separate epoch as the sole possible mode of society and community life, and therefore by no means arduous for its members. On the contrary, each member of one ethnos on coming into contact with another is surprised and bewildered and tries to tell his fellow tribesmen about the funny ways of the other people. Properly speaking, such stories constitute the science of ethnography, as ancient as inter-ethnic connections themselves. Let me cite some examples. The Athenian, who had been to Olbia, related with indignation that the Scythians had no houses and got dead drunk during their festivals. The Scythians, observing the bacchanalias of the Greeks, felt such loathing that once, having seen their own king, who was staying in Olvia, in a wreath and with a tharsis in his hands and a procession of jubilant Hellenes, the Scythians killed him. That is, that they killed their own king because he was behaving in a Greek manner. The Jews hated the Romans because they ate pork, while the Romans considered the custom of circumcision to be unnatural. The knights who conquered Palestine were outraged by the Arab custom of polygamy, while the Arabs considered the uncovered faces of French ladies to be shameless, and so on. There is a great number of examples. Ethnographic science has overcome such ingenuousness and taken into observation systems principles as the operative standard of the relations of individuals, of different categories, of the collective as a whole, and to each other. Let me take as an example the simple case of marital sexual relations. Roughly speaking, we know monogamous, polygamous, and polyandrous families, group marriages, unstable pairing marriages, compulsory inheritance of wives, the leveret marriage, and sometimes even full freedom of sexual relations. Among some peoples we know, artlessness is compulsory in marriage for girls, and among others, preliminary training and love techniques. Divorce is sometimes easy, sometimes difficult, sometimes impossible. Among such peoples, the cohabitation of wives with other men is punished as marital infidelity. Among others, it is encouraged. We can analyze variations of the perception of sense of duty in just the same way. In feudal England or France, a vassal was obliged to serve only if he had received a benefice or salary. Lacking such, he had the right to transfer to another suzerain for example, to the Spanish king. Only transfer to an infidel, for example, to the Muslims, was considered treason, but that happened so often that a special term, or renegade, arose without a pejorative nuance. In Rome or Greece, on the contrary, the performance of social obligations was not accompanied with payment, but was the duty of the citizen of Apollos. These citizens, incidentally, frequently got so much profit from public work that they rewarded themselves beyond measure. The strength of the ethnic stereotype of behavior is immense because the members of an ethnos perceive their own stereotype as the only one worthy of a man who has the right to respect, while all others are barbaric or savage. That is why European colonizers called Indians, Africans, Mongols, and even Russian savages although the same could rightly be said of the English. But Chinese haughtiness was even more categorical. Here, for example, is what a geographical handbook of the Qin Epoch said about France. Quote, it lies in the southwestern sea. In 1518, the king sent an envoy with credentials and requested that he be recognized as king. Close quote. Footnote 7. The Variability of Behavioral Stereotypes an ethnos' stereotype of behavior is as dynamic as the ethnos itself. Rituals, customs, and standards of relationship sometimes change slowly and gradually, and sometimes very quickly. Take England, for example. Can one really recognize the descendants of the berserker Saxon who murdered Celtic babies in the, in the gay outlaw Robin Hood or the archer of the White Bands? 
and his heir and the pilot, pirate sailor of Sir Francis Drake or in Cromwell's Ironsides and their heir, the city clerk in London. But England has always been a country with stable traditions. What should be said about other ethnoi, whose image has not only been influenced by internal development, but also by incidental external effects, cultural borrowings, conquests involving forced changes of customs, and finally, by economic pressures, changing the ethnos' kind of occupations and violently regulating its needs. Footnote 8. When speaking of an ethnos' stereotype of behavior, we always have to include the epoch we're concerned with, and it should not be thought that so-called savage or primitive tribes are more conservative than civilized nations. That idea arose exclusively as a consequence of lack of study of Indians, Africans, and Siberian peoples. It was sufficient to organize the sale of whiskey in Canada or to import tin goods into Tahiti in exchange for copper, immediately to alter the pattern of behavior of the Dakotas and Polynesians, seldom for the better. But in all cases, the changes took their own path on the basis of already established habits and notions. That is the uniqueness of any ethnogenetic process and the reason why these processes never copy one another. But there is also a pattern to it if one only knows how to find it. Any number of examples could be proposed, including ones about complex standards of behavior affecting legal, economic, social, everyday, religious, and other relations, however complex. In the jargon of the humanitarian sciences, the phenomenon described is known as a tradition or modification of social relations, but on the plane of the, un on the, plane of the natural sciences, it is legitimately treated as a stereotype of behavior that varies in local zones and intraspecific populations. The second aspect, though unaccustomed, is, as we shall see below, fruitful. So an ethnos is a collective of individuals that distinguishes itself from all other collectives. It is more or less stable, although it arises and disappears in historical time. There is no one real attribute for defining an ethnos applicable to all the cases known to us. Language, origin, customs, material culture, and ideology are sometimes determinant elements, but sometimes not. Let us take just one, each individual's recognition that, quote, we are such and such, and all others are different, unquote. Since this phenomenon is general, it consequently reflects some physical or biological reality that is also my sought-for quantity. This quantity can only be interpreted by analyzing the origin and disappearance of ethnoi and establishing the fundamental differences of ethnoi from each other, and subsequently describing the pattern of behavior of either of them so as to distinguish their differences by means of comparison. But one must remember that an ethnos's behavior changes with age, i.e., from the time of its entry onto the historical arena. It is therefore necessary to introduce into the analysis a means of recording the ethnodynamics, so as to get a second approximation of the concept ethnos. Such will be the psychological element, on the one hand inherent in all people without exception, and on the other hand quite variable, so as to serve as an indicator of the ethnic dynamics. It is the relation of an ethnos as an entity to the category of time.